Okay, um, just as a little bit of a prelude, in the late 1990s, the National Archives and Records Administration embarked on a multi-year project to re-encase the Charters of Freedom. Um, they had been put in encasements in the early 1950s by the then National Bureau of Standards. Um, that organization is now the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And at the time, um, those NBS encasements were state of the art. They were designed to protect um, the documents over many, many years, um, provide a preservation environment. And they did a, a fabulous job for about 50 years. But in the mid-1990s, a number of factors came together which made it possible for the National Archives to think about um, a number of activities including a renovation of this building that we're in, including the rotunda and our display places, um, and also to think about an improved mechanism for encasing and displaying the Charters of Freedom. Um, you, as you can imagine, in the 50 years since their first encasement, um, information and knowledge changes about materials, techniques of display, etc. So the project to do the re-encasement brought together a very large group of people who worked probably from the mid-1990s um, until the documents went back on exhibit in 2003. The role that Kitty and I played in the project was to, uh, we helped with the design um, and thinking about the display and the preservation requirements, but our special role was to focus specifically on the documents themselves, to remove them from their 1950s era encasements, to do examination and treatment, and then to re-encase them in the new, um, the new enclosures that were fabricated. So it was a fabulous experience for us and probably something that um, in a conservator's working life is a once-in-a-lifetime once activity. So we, we were very fortunate. So not only was it a privilege and an opportunity uh, for us to be involved in this project, but during the course of the events, it was our obligation to capture as much information as possible about the documents via direct handling and observation during the brief period of time in which they were not within an encasement, either the original NBS encasement or the new ones that they were going to be going into. Though there is some documentary evidence regarding the history and storage of the documents, as well as a report on the conservation treatment that was accorded the declaration in the 1940s, there is relatively little recorded data about their physical and chemical condition. The documents, however, have an amazing story to tell us about their creation, storage, handling, and exhibition. So what we'll focus on this afternoon are the clues that help to tell this story and the examination techniques that we used to reveal more. Like other significant 18th century legal documents, the charters were written by hand by scribes on parchment. The declaration was written in Philadelphia in 1776. The Constitution was written in 1787 while the Bill of Rights was written in New York in 1789. During this period, both Philadelphia and New York were centers of government and commerce, and it's very likely that the parchment that was used was imported from England, rather than parchment that was made in the colonies. The parchment skins were purchased and used years apart from one another, and very likely came from different parchment makers. The documents were written by different scribes who each, no doubt, had their final, did their own final surface preparation of the skins, including polishing and smoothing to meet their own working needs for the writing that they were going to do. So declaration, constitution, mm -hmm. And the Bill of Rights, okay. The parchment skins, the parchment skins are relatively large. Given their size, it is likely that they are calf skins, though this has not been determined analytically. 
Most of the skins have axillary marks, evident that relate to the anatomy of the animal, where the skin conform to the shape of a leg or a shoulder. And you can see um, those marks on the image on the screen. The quality, color, and surface characteristics of the parchment varies due to a number of factors, including original source animal, method of manufacture and finishing the skins, and also the condition of storage and handling of the documents for more than 200 years. The parchment of the declaration is somewhat more uneven in color, varying from off-white to tan. The translucency of the skin also varies across its surface. The five skins that comprise the four pages of the Constitution and its transmittal page do not appear to be of the highest quality. The skins are somewhat greasy and exhibit numerous axillary marks and are, are opaque and somewhat horny and hard. It is not known how difficult it may have been to acquire five relatively large and somewhat similar sheets of parchment for the task of writing out the Constitution. An interesting artifact that was noted on each of the skins is a small central pinhole, which I think you can see at the top right hand of that slide. This may have been a device used by the stationer's office to tie or pin the group of skins together as a unit, or the scribe may have pinned the skins together to trim them or to simply hold them together for storage until they were needed. Much more visible artifacts on the parchment comprising the Constitution are six vertical slits, which you can see across the top edges of those two pages, each about 2.5 centimeters or one inch long across the top edges of the skins. These slits were cut to permit a ribbon to be threaded through them, thereby holding the parchment sheets together. Decorative silk ribbons often, were often used for this purpose, and while the lacy material used to hold the leaves of the Constitution together no longer exists, the slits show ample evidence of this technique. A slight blue color was noted near several of the slits, which provides evidence of the color of the ribbon. This lacing method was used on other important documents of the period, as can be seen on the Maryland ratification of the Constitution. The scribe of the declaration was Timothy Matlock. Jacob Shallus, who was an assistant clerk of the Pennsylvania State Assembly, was the scribe of the Constitution and was paid $30 to, to transcribe and engross the document. William Lampert wrote out the Bill of Rights. We have sometimes thought about the careful, if hurried, work these scribes carried out over two centuries ago and wonder if they had any sense that the work of their hand would be considered icons in a future age. $30 does not seem like very much by today's standards for doing this fabulous work. Each of the charter's documents was written on the recto or front only, although at some later time in history, a title was written on the verso of the declaration to permit easy identification of the document while it was rolled for storage. The text was written on the smoother or flesh side, the smoother flesh side of the skin rather than the hair side of the parchment. The documents were written in iron gall ink, which was li likely made by each scribe or calligrapher according to slightly different recipes. The color of the ink varies among the documents, but in general is a warm dark brown or black tone as opposed to the lighter color it would have been when the documents were first written. The text almost completely fills many of the pages, leaving little margin areas. The letters are carefully formed in the style of the day, and the lines of text are very straight. Evidence remains of the devices used to achieve such long, straight lines of text. There are light rule lines in various media on all three of the documents that were used to guide the pen. These rule lines are visible to the naked eye if one looks carefully. Colors range from gray to reddish brown. 
pinpricks down the side of a manuscript were often used by scribes to create straight lines, but we found no evidence of such devices. If they ever existed, they may have been removed when the documents were trimmed. So I think you can see pretty clearly these very faint lines that um, were used to, to create the, the really amazingly straight lines of text. The hand of the scribe can also be seen in the ink smears, splatters, and splotches that appear randomly on the recto and verso of the documents. They are a natural artifact of a quill pen that was perhaps overloaded with ink or that caught on the rough surface of parchment. Overall, the documents were neatly written, but the small random ink spatters were very useful as they provided a non-text source of ink for sampling and identification purposes, as Kitty will describe in a few minutes. Other evidence of the human hand and error can be seen in the erasures, corrections, and errata or inserts that are found on the documents. Pen knives were used to scrape ink off the surface of the parchment when corrections had to be made. These scraped areas have a rougher surface texture than the surrounding skin and as a result have often tended to pick up dirt and soil. A whole line of text was scraped away near the bottom of page one of the Constitution. To our modern eye, it appears as a disfiguring mistake, but at the time of writing, perfectly correct content was clearly more important than aesthetics. As noted, much evidence remains of the materials and techniques used to create the charters. Information on the handling, storage, and exhibition of the documents also can be gleaned by examining them carefully. All seven sheets of parchment that comprise the Charters of Freedom were held in a perfectly flat plane in the NBS encasements. The free-floating piece of glass that rested on top of each document held it flat and in proper position, though the weight of the glass also tended to flatten the natural undulations of the skin. However, there is evidence of previous rolling and folding for storage and transport that persists and is readily visible. For example, on the declaration, there is evidence of two pronounced vertical creases that are a remnant of the document having been folded into thirds at some time in the past. And I think if you look carefully, especially near the bottom, you can see um, some sense of fold lines. There's also evidence of several horizontal fold lines though these are somewhat more obscured by text. Evidence that the declaration was also rolled can be seen from the title that is written on the verso, as well as the grimy bottom edge that would have been exposed when the document was rolled. In addition, there are numerous small horizontal creases and that likely resulted from repeated rolling of the document. Though later flattened for display, such evidence of, fast, of past physical manipulation is a permanent alteration that cannot be reversed. Now what this, so what you're seeing on the right is the back of the declaration with the title, um, Declaration of Independence, followed by the date. So when the document was rolled, that's what people, what different clerks would see as they were pulling various skins out for examination. But what we did not ever see on the back of the declaration is something that, for some reason, Nicolas Cage was able to observe. <laughs> Do you see a map on the back of this? No. He just had this magic touch that he also had some lemon juice. And I will admit that Kitty and I never, ever thought about applying lemon juice to the back of the Declaration of Independence. We would not have wished to lose our jobs. <laughs> The ingrained dirt and handling marks on the document are another permanent remnant of their history. This can be seen not only in the grime at the bottom edge of the declaration, but in the very visible handprint that is on the bottom left corner of the recto of the document. When, 
by whom and under what circumstances this handprint occurred is not recorded. But at this point, it is an artifact of the document. Attempts to remove or clean it would likely be unsuccessful, unsuccessful given its age, the overall condition of the parchment, and the dirt in the surrounding area. Thus, we, choose, we chose not to remove or to minimize the handprint or other random intimations of fingerprints and marks, some of which appear to be in printer's ink. The latter may be artifacts of past initiatives to create facsimiles of the document. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed the handprint when you've looked at the declaration in, in person. Have you, have you seen it before? If you, if when you, if, if, but you've all seen the charters at this point. Well, after this talk, definitely go into the rotunda and look. And if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, um, close to the bottom edge of the case, you'll see um, a sense of a handprint. I think it looks a little bit more obvious in this image. You agree? Yeah. yeah. But we have sometimes wondered, of course, you know, how did that happen? Who did it? And how horrible they must have felt. And then what techniques they might have used to try to scrub at it and remove it kind of shortly after it happened. But um, given the passage of time, uh, I think that our attempts would have not had very good results. Um, the presence of grime as an artifact of age and handling was, was also visible on the very edges of the declaration. The bottom and right edges of the parchment exhibit dark grime, while the top and left edges are not uniformly grimy. The presence of both grimy and cleaner edges on the same document shows that it was trimmed at some point, thereby removing a bit of margin as well as historic dirt. The trimming of the declaration was done perilously close to the text, and in one case it appears that the flourish of a final letter of a word was trimmed away. The reason for trimming is not known, but it can be speculated that it was to give the document a more uniform shape for a previous mounting. Above the engrossed phrase, in Congress, there are two short lines of what appears to be graphite that may have served as guides for trimming the edge. In this same area, the cleaner cut edge is also ragged, which indicates that it was cut with a dull blade. By current standards of practice, trimming the edges of such a document would be considered a radical and unethical act. This is yet another example of physical evidence telling a story that not otherwise is documented in <coughs> contemporary reports or publications. The degree of ingrained dirt and grime on the Charter's documents varies, but the Declaration, which was much loved by the American people, bears the greatest evidence of historical grime due to extensive handling and exhibition. The degree to which surface cleaning could or should be carried out was carefully considered. One goal of conservation treatment was to stabilize the documents, but we had to be equally careful to remove no evidence or information that the documents contained. Thus, we had to be extremely careful to avoid text as well as the faint roll lines. The end result had to be visually consistent and avoid creating alternating patches of bright clean and grimy parchment, which would be vis visually dis disfiguring. Since much of the grime was permanently ingrained, we used a very light touch in surface cleaning, both to preserve the evidence and, return the surface and to retain the surface texture and quality of the skin. Evidence or remnants of previous mounting techniques also provide information that is not otherwise documented, and in some instances, these clues provide insights into the current condition of the documents. Evidence of previous mounting techniques is especially evident on the Declaration, though the reverse of this document, as, as with all of the pages of the Constitution, contain residual adhesive which indicates that at some time in the past they were attached overall to some kind of a amount or support. There are many small Y-shaped puncture holes along the bottom and right edges of the declaration that had not been previously noted. So to find something, um, a, a historical clue like that was, was pretty exciting for us. Uh, these punctures have sharp edges 
were made from the recto side and are located a few millimeters in from the parchment perimeter. The spacing of the punctures is not uniform. They're about three to four centimeters apart and their purpose is not known or documented. However, it is likely that they were used in some previous stitched edge mount or housing. Similar edge restraint techniques have been used for other historical parchment documents from the, the period. Occasional loose textile fibers, mostly dark green in color, were found randomly over the recto surface of the declaration. These fibers likely originated from the green velvet mat in which the document was on display at the Library of Congress. There were also a number of very small wooden splinters, visible only with the aid of a microscope, that were embedded in the parchment surface of the declaration, possibly from some previous mounting or flattening efforts during past conservation treatment. There is evidence that the, the declaration suffered damage as a result of a mounting technique known as drumming, in which the edges of a document are secured around the perimeter of a mount. Parchment is hygroscopic, um, meaning that it will respond in, um, if there are changes in the, the relative humidity. So it will expand and contract under conditions of fluctuating RH. In, in the mounting technique, if the mounting technique that's used does not permit the skin to respond to changing conditions, some part of the system will fail. In this instance, the mount was stronger than the parchment, and the top right corner of the declaration detached and split away. The corner was reattached during the conservation treatment carried out by George Stout and Virginia Ehrlich in 1942, when the document had been removed from the Library of Congress to Fort Knox for safekeeping during World War II. Though carefully mended and secure, visual evidence of the tear and an unsuitable mounting technique remains. Evidence of insect feeding on the edges of the pages of the Constitution while they were on exhibit at the Library of Congress provided the impetus for encasing the charters in an oxygen-free environment in the early 1950s. As part of our conservation treatment, these lacy feeding edges were filled with Japanese paper that was toned, laminated, and burnished to approximate the surface characteristics of the surrounding parchment. While the declaration did not suffer insect damage, it did exhibit small edge tears and losses as a result of rigorous handling over the years. To ensure that the parchment was not vulnerable to further tearing, we proceeded to mend all edge tears. We carefully considered whether to replace the mends and fills applied to the declaration 60 years previous by Stout and Ehrlich. However, after careful examination, we decided to retain these artifacts of their previous treatment, which had been executed with a high degree of skill and craftsmanship, and which were still securely attached. This is yet another example of retaining the evidence of the past on these cherished documents. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm going to talk about the examination, scientific examination that we did on the documents. Um, the examination including, included determining their condition for a couple of reasons. One, it was to guide us in making decisions about the treatment steps that they, uh, we would propose and get permission to um, carry out. Uh, we also wanted to create records because uh, they had been sealed up for 60 years and we didn't know how many more decades or centuries they might remain sealed up. And so it was a unique opportunity to document their current state of condition. Um, so we were, in some instances, finding out what their condition was in, in scientific terms. We were also creating baseline measurements so that in the future, if these measurements would be repeated, you could see if there had been change or not. One of the things we wanted to do was to uh, measure the color of the parchment and the ink. And there's a system, it's a called LAB, it measures the lightness and darkness, 
the blue yellow and the uh, the redness of the uh, the parchment and the ink and to be able to create baselines we had to very carefully um, measure and map the locations that were measured and one of the things we did we we both measured them uh, in the metric system but we also cr took large sheets of clear polyester film and traced the documents and uh, trace sufficient information so that we could record this is exactly where we took our measurement and then we're retaining these tracings and they will be an aid to anyone in the future who might want to uh, repeat measurements. So uh, <coughs> let me, let's see, is what's advancing the, the era? Okay. Did I jump? Yes. Okay. So, examination. Um, to help us make our treatment decisions, our treatment proposals, to create baselines and uh, maps. And we also wanted to measure just uh, the thickness of the parchment. Um, just to clarify, and uh, one of my, my hopes whenever people hear about the charters is to be clear that they're written on parchment and animal skin that's been prepared in a special way. And as an animal skin, it's extremely variable in thickness uh, from uh, one point to another, even on uh, the same sheet. So uh, it was very important to measure the thickness, partly to document the, the support, but also it would guide us in our treatments because uh, as you saw in the declaration, there were some losses also on the Constitution and when we prepared Japanese paper fills for those areas, we wanted to match the thickness as closely as we could to the original. That creates a very smooth transition from the fill to the original and uh, makes it look better. It won't uh, have bulges or uh, look uneven. So we talked about thickness. Um, Another thing we were very interested in doing, Mar Marilyn mentioned these documents were written at th uh, three different points in time uh, by three different men in two different cities. And in the 18th century, ink was still something that could be made from uh, recipes and could vary. Just like if you're making uh, a recipe and you find you don't have quite enough sugar, you might use less sugar right now. So the, the co actual composition of the inks could possibly vary. And when you look at the colors, there are s subtle differences, both from document to document, but even from one area to another, depending on how much ink is present. Iron gall ink is uh, uh, actually a uh, 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 ink that's constantly changing chemically. It's, uh, uh, it oxidizes and it changes with age. Um, so the inks vary in color and we wanted to be able to characterize them. The condition of the ink was also a, a real concern to us. Um, and I think you, this is a nice uh, comparison of the three documents, the Constitution on the left, uh, and the color of the Constitution, I have to say that's not correct, it's too green. Uh, the, co the color of the parchment on the right is more characteristic. It's a very subtle, soft, off-white. Uh, it's not the bright white we're used to in papers today, but it's certainly not the, the kind of mustard yellow of so-called parchment paper that you see in the reproductions of these documents. Um, and the ink itself, I think you can see in the Constitution, the, the bold and gross lines, very thick lines, are blacker. The thinner text lines underneath are uh, somewhat more brown, and that's because there's less ink there and it's uh, oxidized more. And you can see that both the Declaration and the Bill of Rights, the ink is somewhat diminished. Uh, there's some uh, lack of intensity there. We, were, we could see through the glass of the encasements that there were small losses uh, in the heavy ink strokes on the Constitution. And um, basically some ink present on the surface had flaked away. Mary Lynn mentioned uh, that there were little uh, threads visible caught actually on some of the lifting up flakes. So at some point in the past there had been some vigorous rubbing of the surface and that may well have caused some ink to flake off. 
Nonetheless, even though when you magnify these, you can see some gaps, when you stand in front of the documents, your eye does not register that there's things missing. Your eye has an ability to, to make things look complete. And they do read very well uh, without magnification. Um, we wanted to be sure that one of our big concerns was when we opened the encasements, the glass in the old encasements rested directly against the parchment. There was nothing lifting it up. And uh, we had some concern, could there be ink flakes that were adhered to the inner surface of the glass? And if we lift it off, was that going to be a risk to the glass, uh, the glass lifting off ink? We wanted to be very careful. This, this gives you a good uh, contrast. The, the very good condition of the running text on the Constitution, which you see on the left, and yet uh, losses of, of flakes of ink in the center of the bold and gross lines, the big capitals and headings on the document. So one of the, the, the most fraught moments was when we lifted the glass up off the document. And so with great care, wearing gloves, um, we lifted off the first glass. And you can see the glass itself had gotten kind of cloudy from um, chemicals given off by uh, close contact with the ink and the parchment over 60 plus years. But as we lifted it off, there were no ink flakes on the glass and no evidence that there was uh, any damage to the documents that had resulted in loose flakes. Nonetheless, because you, you saw the condition of some uh, loss of ink in the center of many of the bold letters, uh, one of the first things that we intended to do in our treatment was to consolidate the ink. Uh, that's a, a technical term for introducing microscopically small droplets of adhesive under any flake still uh, still attached to the parchment but lifting up. So if this were the parchment surface, there, there were places uh, in the, under a microscope, you could see a lifted ink flake. It was in its correct location, but vulnerable. And so what we wanted to do was feed into this gap a tiny droplet, smaller than the, the period at the end of a sentence. And it was uh, an adhesive based on parchment itself, and it was warm. And so the warmth and the moisture had the effect of relaxing the flake and letting it sort of lie back down in, into place. Uh, and it used capillarity as it cooled, it pulled down of itself. We didn't have to actually touch the ink at all. So we examined basically letter by letter, every letter in a line, uh, looking for areas that were insecure. Uh, to verify that uh, it was necessary to consolidate. We made a treatment proposal to do consolidation as our first step. We wanted to do this because we were eager to turn the documents over, but we couldn't do that until we had secured the ink. So what you see in this image is uh, the bottom half of a binocular microscope. Uh, this is uh, magnifies between about uh, well, pretty low to about 30 or 40 X. And uh, we're holding a, a very fine uh, brush, a triple zero uh, watercolor brush with a tiny droplet of warm uh, parchment size. And that's applied as we look through the microscope just to feed under the edge. One of the other uh, issues that we thought was extremely important to address in this uh, time that we had the documents available for examination was to identify the ink. Uh, Mary Lynn pointed out that some of the pages had these random s splotches and splatters so that uh, there was ink present that could be sampled without t removing an iota from the text itself. Um, there, the key question was that we, uh, in the 1940s, some conservators uh, working at Fort Knox during World War II had uh, examined the documents and they had conducted a spot test on uh, the Declaration of Independence. And in doing so, they had concluded that it was not Iron Gall ink. Now, Iron, Iron Gall ink is the most common writing ink of the period. Uh, they 
said that it was instead sepia or beast. These are um, other kinds of organic materials uh, that are used in creating washes in watercolors or drawings, but it's extremely unusual to uh, expect to find them in a historic document. So we had assumed in advance that this was a point that we should attempt to uh, gather evidence because visually the Declaration of Independence appears to be written in Iron Gall ink. It's simply more degraded. But um, we ended up uh, asking for and receiving permission to take some very, very small samples of ink uh, from non-text uh, areas. And you see here a member of our research and testing lab staff, Margaret Kelly, and she's wearing um, wonderful pale blue gloves. I always think of her when I see them. And she's holding um, a, a very fine uh, needle that has a hollow tip. And it's uh, basically the end has been cut off to create a, a circular hollow. And it's been sharpened so that she's able to remove a, a very small plug just from the surface, does not go straight through the parchment, just the top surface is removed, and that allowed uh, samples of ink and samples of parchment to be taken that are uh, visually, you cannot tell they've been taken, but uh, allowed us to have some scientific analysis carried out. And again, we used our large mylar tracings of the document to document exactly where they were removed because they're really not easy to find. So um, samples of ink were taken. When we got to the declaration, we've, we've mentioned that it's not in, in as robust condition as the Constitution. We found that there was, um, there was really no suitable ink to sample. And we also uh, knew that there was a new kind of indicator paper that could be used to indicate the presence of iron. Uh, the paper is impregnated with a chemical. And when it's moistened and pressed against uh, an iron-containing ink, and then removed, it creates a very characteristic color in the little sample paper. So that's actually what we ended up doing on the Declaration of Independence. We were able to confirm that there's a good deal of iron present. And that uh, also confirms that the ink itself is an iron gall ink, rather than this rather dubious assertion of beast or sepia. Now, I mentioned parchment testing was also one of our uh, concerns. Uh, at the point in the late 1990s when we were doing this work, uh, some of the documents had been exhibited and some had not. And we wanted to be able to verify and uh, compare the condition of the unexhibited parchments, compare them to the ones that had some decades of exhibit and to the Declaration of Independence, which had many decades of exhibit. So we could uh, state definitively what their condition was at this point in time. So uh, by taking these plugs, it was possible to get a baseline for their condition. And the, the test that was applied was, it's a shrinkage test. Degraded parchment uh, will shrink at a much lower temperature than a very, very strong new parchment. And for this testing, we turned to a man in Canada who'd been doing a lot of studying of parchment and using shrinkage tests, tests as a means of doing that. Uh, I mentioned that the Declaration of Independence had a, a long exhibit history. Um, I don't have a picture here of the old patent office, which is now known as the National Portrait Gallery. But it was first exhibited there in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it was the first icon of the American um, democracy and much loved and remained on display for several decades at the, uh, at the patent office, was removed for exhibit in preparation for the centennial exhibit of 1876 and taken to Philadelphia. This turned out to be a very fortunate thing because while it was away, the patent office caught on fire. And all the patent models that were stored up in the attic, most of them of wood, turned out to provide a good deal of fuel. So the top floor where they, uh, it was on exhibit was very severely damaged. So 
uh, the Declaration has had a, a rough life, but it, it, it survived and escaped the fire by virtue of going to the Centennial. Then uh, after the Centennial, with the building damaged, it moved to uh, what was then known as the Old State War Navy Building. And you see on the left uh, a 19th century exhibit case. That building is now known as the Old Executive Office Building and is still standing. Uh, this was a library for the State Department that had a, a large skylight. And one of the concerns has been that uh, the Declaration was exposed to light for decades of the Patent Office, decades of the State Department, and um, by the, during the 19th century, people started to note that the Declaration in particular was in poor condition. And if you have not yet looked at the Declaration, when you go out to look at it, you will agree. It is in much poorer condition than the Constitution. The first uh, historical note of the condition of the Declaration was in 1817, which when you think about it, is not that long after it was created, just a few decades. The acting Secretary of State noted that the, you could see the effects of the hand of time, a very picturesque way of saying it was starting to look a little worse for wear. Then in 1819, John Quincy Adams, the, the next Secretary of State, noted also that in his diary that some damage had occurred. Um, it, this, he suspected, Adams suspected, that Binns, who created one of the early engravings of the Declaration, was responsible. And then later in the 19th century, they actually convened a scientific committee to study and uh, make recommendations, particularly on the, uh, how to stabilize the Declaration. So we were very interested in finding what evidence there was for why the Declaration was in poor condition. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, very early on, people were already talking about how poorly it looked. Um, one of the assertions has been that because the Declaration has been exhibited for so many decades, it must be light damage. And I show you here a detail from the center of the document that includes some of the signature area. And you can see uh, it's, it's quite difficult in some places to even make out the text. Uh, these are details from the signatures themselves and uh, John Quincy Adams' signature in particular. One of the things you can see when you look at the signature area is that at the far left and the far right you can still see some of the historic ink. But the signatures in the middle columns are, are actually not even the same color and don't have the same crisp character of iron gall ink and in some places aren't even in the same place as Stone's facsimile that was printed in 1823. Um, they're not even correct uh, according to where the gray vertical lines are that guided the signatures. Uh, it, in, eight, in 1942, when Stout and Ehrlich examined the document, they actually state, many signatures are largely defaced a number of later marks on these signatures. For example, a yellowish green on the descending hook of the J in John Hancock, on the H and K of the same signature. And I don't know how clear that is in the photograph on the left, but uh, it looks like there's been some uh, retouching or amplification in those areas. So um, basically, and, and what you see, the other detail, the top right, that's some historic ink left, but somewhat diminished. The se bottom center, that's the descender on the J in John Hancock. It's definitely, there's some yellow there, there's some fuzzy gray media. It's just not, it's not iron gall ink. So, um, even though we know the document was displayed for a long, long time, the ink loss in the Declaration is consistent with water damage. And there's no historical record that there was a flood or a leak or anything like that. So we think that this evidence of water damage supports the theory of a wet transfer method uh, used, it's asserted by William Stone uh, to copy the text. But as we noted, the signature area is actually even more damaged than the text area. And we think that it's significant that the two prior prints of the Declaration by Mr. Binns and Mr. Tyler 
Both included facsimile signatures. So it seems likely that those two prints also used some sort of a wet transfer method and that it was repeated use of wet transfer that created the, uh, the offset, to create the offsets of the many signatures that left almost no ink in the center of the signature area. So, and when you consider that the two co early comments on the condition of the declaration actually date from 1817 and 1819, which is before Stone made his print, it, it seems uh, likely that uh, the other two printmakers may have also been uh, responsible for some of this water damage. So you see here uh, the Tyler and Binns engravings. That the, the text is not facsimile on either of these prints, but the signatures at the bottom are uh, very close facsimiles of the signature. Uh, in recent examination, we also used ultraviolet, uh, which is a, a type of uh, radiation that can sometimes reveal obscured or diminished uh, iron gall ink to see if we could see any traces of original signature, but we were not, neither, and we also used infrared, and neither method actually was uh, successful. Uh, in conclusion, the stone engraving of 1823, which you see here on the right, remains the best indication today of what the Declaration looked like in the early 19th century. Uh, it is a sad irony if this engraving and the other two engravings occasioned much of the damage that we see today. And it's even more ironic if you consider that within two decades, uh, photography was invented and the need to uh, make wet offset copies uh, was uh, essentially eliminated by the development of photographic method. Uh, we, th we think that a lesson can be drawn uh, from this that for caretakers of historic documents, that when the techniques at hand are imperfect or hazardous, it's always wise to take a conservative approach and to wait for better methods that will emerge. <laughs>